So I was really glad that uh, Rick, after Rick's flight was cancelled, he got in another one because I really like this paper and I was excited to have a chance to di discuss it and also uh, be a part of the la larger group discussion. And there's a couple of things I want to raise at the end for the, for the general discussion uh, part of this. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, so it's a really important question. These issues of externalities of land use on neighbors are really relevant. Uh, as uh, 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 as a presenter said, on a lot of uh, contemporary urban policy issues, even though the fire itself is not a doesn't isn't a policy implication, there are a lot of really important policy implications that we should be thinking about, including in, uh, in the context of developing country studies in IGC. Um, they've got a really nice and elegant model that kind of captures all the key features of this environment with some really uh, nice sort of testable predictions um, uh, that, that really clearly sort of delineate the way we can see whether there's an externality or not. Um, and the data set construction is incredibly impressive, uh, at, <coughs> as Rick showed. So they use a great fire across in 1872 to, to try to empirically identify the effect of this coordinated building destruction <coughs> and use that to try to find evidence and to, I think, very compelling to do find evidence for these kinds of externalities. Uh, so I'm going to say a couple of things about the empirics, um, as some suggestions about ways. They've already done like a lot of robustness uh, testing on issue, potential issues that could come up with the data as well as with the identification. I'm going to uh, suggest maybe a couple of other things. And then uh, I want to talk a little bit about mechanisms and a little bit about general equilibrium at the end. Okay. <clears throat> so they acknowledge in the paper that the burned and unburned areas have different uh, levels and uh, different pretrends. Um, so there's the, w one way to kind of address that is to look at, which is always kind of present, I think in most of these tables is this restricted sample, which is a, a kind of like an RD <coughs> approach, where we look at just the areas clo closest to the boundary, I think, between the, or between the burned and the unburned area. But um, as Rick also said in the talk, and I think it's very clearly acknowledged in the paper, that this is really difficult to disentangle, and that because the externalities themselves are kind of the key, we, exactly what we expect and the key focus of the paper, there's a spillover from the burned to the unburned, so it's, it's, it's not really possible to disentangle the effect using this boundary approach from the spillover effect. So, so I think they acknowledge that this is, that, that it's sort of a quite, they put in a lot of caveats in the paper about how should we really interpret this, this restricted sample estimate. Um, so, and, and I guess the, uh, I think that they, 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 he didn't have a chance to talk about it in a lot of detail, but the, the various evidence that shows that the stopping point of the fire was pretty uh, exogenous is good, but that, that seems to be more motivating this part of the approach, because as you saw from the map, the burned area was kind of all, it was one whole section of the city. So even if this, so this, the fact that the stopping point would be exogenous would, would uh, uh, be more convincing for comparing those that are areas that are closer to the boundary on either side. Um, and then even with, if, if I'm reading the table one correctly, I think even the restricted sample does have a different pretrend. Um, now, all of this, I, th uh, uh, I think, shouldn't be a huge threat to identification because I think that the, um, I th if I read, if I read that ta the way that table is set up correctly, that should lead to a downward bias in their estimates, um, but, and that may be pot potentially greater for later years. But, a couple, but some other sort of things that could be done to, to maybe push this a little further. Um, the, so the main results all include sort of parametric controls for baseline property values and, and other ca characteristics. Uh, but another thing that could be done that I don't think is in there now would just be to estimate the same specification, very, very easily with the data you already have, it would just be to estimate the same specification on a subset that's matched on baseline values, which wouldn't require these sorts of, which would, wouldn't require the parametric assumptions about, about that relationship. Um, <clears throat> so you could do that with the burned, uh, burned areas to their matched areas and unburned areas and nearby areas to similar, uh, similar areas, and then you don't have this problem of the, the externality and the treatment effect um, uh, being, being sort of di this difficult to disentangle. And the same thing could be done, they've mentioned that you know, uh, there's potential selection bias, especially in the case of the individual fires, where there's not this kind of exogenous shock. The same thing could be, could be done here. Uh, 
it's not a perfect solution, but it, it seems like a, a nice and relatively, straight, relatively <laughs> straightforward sort of robustness check. Um, another possible idea that, that came to mind would be to do some sort of placebo testing using alternative areas that might have been burned. I don't know if the, you know, if the wind had blown a different direction, which areas might have been burned, um, to, to, to sort of verify that this isn't being driven by some being driven by something related to the trend in that part of the city. Um, <clears throat> And as I said, this is like the, what did you call it, the money shot graph in the paper, which I really like, I, I really like this graph. Um, and I was thinking that you could, so this, what this shows is that uh, the, the, the estimated sort of treatment effect, I guess, by distance from the burned area boundary, right? I was thinking that you could make it a, a graph like this, but map it in 2D space with the data that you have already. So overlay it with the burned area. So right now this is a one-dimensional measure of distance from the boundary, but I think it might be even more convincing that what's going on here is an externality if you just overlay that with the, with the maps you already have that show the burn. So if we see this, the same sort of pattern on all areas of, in all directions from the boundary, that would be, I think, really nice, nice to, to sort of verify that. Um, oh, yes, and then uh, again, that, those sorts of maps, I think, I, again, with, with the all of this data, amazing data we've already sort of put together, could again be done you could make a, a, a map in 2D space uh, statically, but also over time, which I think would help. Uh, as the authors have said, the longer the time frame after the fire, the more difficult it becomes to sort of believe the identifying assumptions. So I think the matching may potentially help with that. Um, and again, looking at, even just descriptively, showing a map like this over a, a, a set of maps like this over time would help us to interpret uh, this to interpret the longer run effects as a spillover. Okay, um, so so a couple of thoughts about mechanisms. Clearly, you know, the fire is not the policy implication. What is the policy implication depends a lot on what exactly is the mechanism for the externality that's being estimated here. Um, the, it, you know, there's a range of different possible things which I mentioned really briefly. Uh, the, as far as policy implications mentioned sort of briefly in the, in the introduction. The model, so the model allows for a generic kind of externality of building quality on the rent of the, the, of the building's neighbors. So, you know, the, the building across the street is, is an old and, you know, run-down building, and so the rent that I as a building owner can get f from the building facing it is less. And in the text, they've said that, that this allows for sort of a broad view of neighborhood quality, um, and that, so, but uh, then there's a discussion of p possible mechanisms, which is most of the empirics. I mean, the, all the empirics about this are sort of in the appendix. Um, then there's some evidence for some of them. Nothing that really seems to be kind of driving the results in a big way. Um, and I think that the paper generally could take a more clear stance on which ones of these mechanisms, if any, are, are a sort of mechanism, envisioned as mechanisms for the effects in the model, and which ones are sort of alternative explanations that we want to rule out. And I think from the presentation, maybe it was more clear that they're, they're all being seen as alternatives to the model, but in that case, if they're all alternatives, it would be nice to, to think a bit more explicitly about what, what, exa what exactly is the mechanism for the externality that is in the model. So, you know, it, it could just be that, like, if you think about residential buildings in particular, I just prefer, you know, people prefer to live across from a nicer looking building, so they are willing to pay, pay a higher rent just for that pleasant streetscape. That could be part of it. There, there are other possible things that could be going on here. For, it seems like some of these may be more relevant in the case of uh, residential and some of them may be more relevant in the case of commercial. So maybe there's some interest, some, if, if, the, if the paper kind of takes more of an explicit stance on this, that may lead to other ideas about how to tease out uh, if, if the main drivers are not the, the mechanisms that were discussed in the appendix as alternatives, then what exactly are they? And I think that will um, bring it closer to, to saying more about the, the potential policy implications. Okay, um, so I, I have a sense that this is going to be a theme uh, over several of, the, of the, the sessions here, and it's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately as well. Um, so the affected area was this really large fraction of downtown Boston. Uh, some increases in economic activity may be displaced from other parts of the city. The authors clearly acknowledge that. 
and I think make this very compelling um, sort of response in the conclusion, which is, okay, e even if the overall effect was just displacement from, even if it were 100% displacement from one part of the city to another, the fact that we're seeing these spillovers uh, it, it still demonstrates the fact that they're there and they're really important. They're, they're playing a really important role, which is sort of the main point in the sense of the paper. So even if the effects are relative, the fact that there is this spillover uh, being identified there is still important. But I still wanted to raise it because I think it would be interesting to hear uh, from the dis from the discussion in the room a bit more about how we can think about general equilibrium effects in this kind of line of research because. Uh, it, along the, the, the it, inspired by the idea of, of, of this being kind of a meeting of, of many people working on these very closely related things, it would be nice to, I think, uh, generate some, some ideas about that and hear what people have to say. Um, I think that's, yep, all I have. Good Thanks morning. very much. Thank you for a great Okay, we have uh, maybe 10 minutes for, for questions. Please go ahead. A very interesting paper, but you know, one still can't uh, get away from the strong impression that you need fires to get this going. Uh, I'd be very interested in finding out what were the institutional changes that took place as a result of the fire that changed the, the way the building codes were, were written up, the way the construction material specifications changed, etc. What were the institutional changes that happened? Because those could be replicated. Uh, uh, hopefully not fires. Yeah, I mean, there, there was a lot of debate at the time about, um, you know, whether they wanted to change the building codes. You know, and in the end, actually, it was sort of a political, uh, political coalition of the landowners that, that wanted to reconstruct very quickly that actually, like, rolled back a lot of the changes that the city tried to make. So in, in the end, there weren't actually a lot of institutional changes. There's this nice book by Christine Rosen in the 1980s called Limits of Power, which basically focuses on this across, both, uh, across Boston, Chicago, Baltimore, uh, basically showing that during these periods of change, um, it, there are these opportunities for potential change, but the vested political interests you know, stay very much in place, and it actually serve as a, as a broad limit of, of the power of political bodies to really affect institutional change at these times. And so, why are fires different from earthquakes? Hmm? Because earthquakes are always limited institutional change. Uh, you know, not necessarily, but, uh, you know, yeah, so, you know, but in Chicago, you had a very different political dynamic where they tried to, you know, change wood frame buildings to brick. It's just in Boston, you basically had masonry type buildings that, uh, even before the fire, that were masonry type buildings after the fire. Remember, Boston had its first anti fire regulation in 1631, the same year the city was founded. Okay, thanks, Rick. Um, I have two questions. So, the first one is actually a com comment. Um, I think a fire is actually great uh, because this is essentially ex exogenous uh, uh, um, part of the story. But the policy implication is, comes in, in many forms, and this is essentially leveling off many districts or slums in developing countries, or policymakers leveling off also other quarters, Ceausescu, for example, in Bucharest. Now we have China leveling off other districts. Uh, but this is often directed with uh, some um, uh, aim in mind. So it's, you would expect that uh, when you level off, get rid of one slum, build something there, that uh, housing values would increase. Okay, so I, I think this is actually a great, uh, great uh, story that you're telling. The second thing I was uh, wanted, to, uh, what I wanted to ask is about what is the right size of the fire? Because if you have just one uh, fire of, of one house, you don't have externalities. Now you increase that, the externalities are kicking in, but you increase even more, all of Boston vanishes. Would you still get the externality? So, what is the right size of the fire to get the optimum <laughs> <laughs> amount? And this so, is then so in our, in our model, and actually in general, in a model with perfect capital markets, th there wouldn't even really be a limit to the the size of the fire you'd want. If you could burn the whole thing, uh, if you could burn the whole thing, you'd want to burn burn the whole thing. Uh, I see. All right, Steve. <laughs> I wonder if um, you could rule out another story as well. So when Boston was built, say, in 1600, when I sort of organized land use in that area, I had some expectation about how the city would develop. But of course, by the time I get to 1850, I'm probably way out in the tails of that distribution, right? Boston is one of the largest cities in the U.S. I may not have fully expected that in 1600. So when I built the neighborhood that burnt in 1600, I had some sort of expected 
pattern of economic activity in mind. By the time I get to 1850, the actual pattern may be very different from my expectation. And of course, as buildings depreciate and have individual fires, you maybe have to change use a little bit, but it's very hard to sort of affect the reorganization of economic activity within the entire city. Whereas what the fire does is it enables you to affect that change in organization. And then because the city is more efficiently organized, that would then explain the higher land values in the areas as well. Yeah, that's effectively what we have in mind. Markets and changes in the internal organization of economic activity in the city. Yeah, and I think that's very much. I think that's very much what we have in mind. And, and then the question becomes one of mechanism, sort of like, what is the reorganization that you have in mind? Is it, is it largely the fact that they widened the water mains? And that was one thing we talked about in the paper. We've actually done some more recent work uh, that yes, I mean they widened the water mains after the Boston fire, but they've been planning to do that in general for some time and widened the water mains even in the unburned areas uh, over this time and. And road widening, we're sort of looking into more. So, like, some of it would be from a public infrastructure point of view. Some of it would be from sort of an industrial land use point of view. Um, uh, you know, you could imagine, for example, like, uh, you know, in the more modern periods, you have harbors that, you know, become sort of dilapidated and, and become sort of more disamenities that you then get sort of renewal of the harbors and they turn into residential condo type areas. So I think a lot of it would depend on sort of, you'd have to look at the context of whatever particular city it was when the things were built and when they were destroyed would sort of give you some sense of the change that's effective. But I think that's roughly what we have in mind with the model, that, that, that essentially things are laid out in some historical period, and you never really get this full opportunity to really re redo it. And that's essentially what the fire does. And, and not just in the slums, where people think about it in sort of developing, in like modern developing country context, but even in, I mean, I found it very frustrating sometimes living in Boston or when I go to Manhattan or something, because you see these very valuable places, but you're just like, it could be so much better. Uh, you know, if, 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 if certain externalities were internalized. And so that's a little bit on the policy is that, yeah, it's not so much, you know, the fire itself, but once you sort of get into the world of there, these large externalities, you know, then you, you can start to get into either taxing negative externalities, subsidizing, subsidizing positive externalities, or just trying to reduce transactions costs and define property rights and such that the market can sort of deal with those more efficiently. And so, you know, we kind of know how, once we sort of know these externalities are large, and in wealthy areas, then we sort of have the policy levers in mind already to try to address those externalities. So quick, quick question, in these big uh, urban fires, do we always know that they are unintentional? I mean, a lot of the forest fires, for example, they're, you know, people, people, you know, trying to uh, put forests on fire to actually change land use, to start building on them, et cetera? Yeah. No, I wouldn't know that in every case it's, it's unintentional. Um, uh, yeah, and certainly, like, uh, there was a lot of, we found in, in, in these individual building fires, we found some really strikingly anti-Semitic uh, statements by the fire commissioner blaming, you know, Jews uh, for burning their buildings uh, and, and stuff like that. So, I mean, there was a, I mean, there was a lot of, of concerns about that. But for the Boston, for this fire, you know, yeah, there's not a sense that, like, oh, this was an area that they, this was like a slum that they wanted to get rid of, and so landowners bound together and, 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 and did this. <laughs> yeah, um, so, someone was mentioning the importance of, uh, of equilibrium effect, and I think if, if part of the effect is sorting, that, that's, that's very important for the whole identification, because yeah. essentially you get this, this place to, right, to build the new, I mean, more modern buildings, so you're going to attract the uh, richest people, but if not, they will have gone to some places that are in your control, and, and so that's, that's an issue to think yeah. about. Yeah, and I think that speaks to like this side and, and the next one that you know, we, yeah, we don't we don't necessarily just think of them all as sort of alternatives to be ruled out from each other. Some of these are very complementary. I think the, the 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 sense in which building reconstruction can drive occupant sorting, uh, and then some of that could could go into the sort of general equilibrium effects. That yeah, it's possible that they could be drawing from the control area. They could be drawing generally from the metropolitan area outside the control area, but. Um, certainly there could be sort of displacement. And so like, there, there was sort of a caveat built into the presentation where I said, if we assume that places beyond 1,400 feet are unaffected, then this is sort of like the total quote, welfare effect. But you can't necessarily assume that places beyond 1,400 feet are unaffected. And, and in that sense, you can think of it as more of like a local gain to the burned area that's potentially coming at the expense of you know, further away places. And, and certainly, like, you know, I think in my mind, what you would want to do with these GE type effects is you'd want to have different cities that burned, and basically, like, and there are those sorts of papers, but um, we think of sort of a city-level analysis sort of complementing 
the sort of within city sort of analysis that we do here. Okay, but the work part is less clear if it's just. Uh, right. Yeah, and that's why I think at the end of the day, we're less about is the fire good, and we're more about is the fire illustrative of certain rigidities and certain spillovers. Yeah, Kate, Kate was quite clear on that. I mean, that was, yeah. that was in, in her comment on the, on the mechanism, and I think that your point was quite well taken, but it's, it's unclear. Uh, Matt? If the fire makes Boston a nicer place, people should move in. And it might be interesting to check whether population growth rates for Boston diverged from Providence and New York and Philadelphia around the time of the fire. Yeah, we could try to look at city level stuff, but of course, I mean, there's a very inelastic supply of housing uh, in Boston. So, I mean, my prior would be that overall population is fairly unaffected. Like, the, the number of units of, of buildings is pretty much unaffected by the fire. You know, you had something slightly different after the San Francisco earthquake and fire, just because you're starting to get into a period where they could build higher. It's all sort of pre-skyscraper, and it's all pre-even sort of eight-floor buildings and such. Like, this, the fire didn't take place at a time when they could have really increased the population of the city very much. But I, but I take the point that there's an, you know, in general, I think, and a lot of urban papers are written this way, that essentially population serves as sort of a summary statistic for indicating that some amenity value has gone up. Here we take sort of a complementary approach is land value. Like land value is essentially our summary statistic for the fact that there's some amenity that's increased uh, in Boston. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. I think, I think the point here is, is that this is a paper that is both of sort of interest in a, in a historical sense, but, and it's fun, but it also is really of first order policy importance because the issue of coordinated upgrading of structures and infrastructure is a huge policy issue throughout the world. And it doesn't mean that this paper in any sense gives you the right answer for what choose your, insert your city here should be doing, but it is helpful to have you know, facts and example and working out a methodology of how we can go forward to thinking about, thinking about these things. So thank you very much, uh, Rick. Thank and you thanks for the comments. Great.